This week on The Inside Story, a Caribbean nation descends deeper into chaos. The State Department pledges increased support to resolve the crisis. A Kenyan-led multinational armed force in doubt as disagreement swells in Nairobi. And hip-hop star Wyclef Jean weighs in on the future of his embattled home country. Now, on The Inside Story, Haiti in Crisis. Lee in Washington. Today we focus on the situation in Haiti as that Caribbean nation descends further into chaos. National police are working to regain some control of the capital, Port-au-Prince, as rival gangs fight amongst themselves and civilians cower in their homes. How did we get here? And is there hope the world could come together to stop the violence? All this on today's Inside Story. Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry recently announced his resignation one day after the United States pledged another $100 million to a United Nations-backed multinational security force. The money is for assisting the country's police in combating gangs. The U.S. pledged an additional $33 million in humanitarian aid. VOA State Department Bureau Chief Nike Ching starts us off this week from Washington. A political crisis and rising violence have created an untenable situation for the Haitian people. Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry has agreed to step down after a transitional authority is established that will govern the violence-plagued nation until new elections are held. The United States is urging him to expedite this transition. The United States Department of Defense is doubling its approved support for the mission from $100 million to $200 million. And that brings the total U.S. support to $300 million for this effort. I'm also announcing additional humanitarian assistance for the people of Haiti, $33 million to further support their health and food security. At the United Nations, diplomats hope the deployment of the UN-endorsed multinational security support mission to Haiti will help the country stop the violence. Some analysts believe the mission can create the security conditions necessary for upcoming elections. Some of it is financial support to actually support this mission. Uh, the, the, the United States Southern Command is already on record as indicating that they are in in process of providing uh, planning assistance, uh, information sharing and intelligence relating to the situation on the ground in Haiti. Others are skeptical of foreign forces pouring into Haiti. And you've seen members of Haitian civil society who come to testify before Congress that have said, we don't want additional forces in our country because forces have come in here, they've raped our women, they've spread disease, They've, you know, collaborated with criminal elements. The Caribbean community said the Transitional Council for Haiti would consist of seven members representing political coalitions and the private sector, plus two non-voting civil society members. This council will appoint a new prime minister and initiate preparations for upcoming presidential elections. Nike Chin, VOA News, Washington. The relationship between the United States and Haiti dates back nearly a century to 1934. It's been, at times, a troubling history, marred by corruption and ever-changing dynamics between the two nations. For more on how we got here, VOA's Arash Arabasadi brings us this timeline of events. The United States occupies Haiti from 1915 to 1934. 
a new Haitian military force forms following the U.S. military withdrawal. Francois Papadoc Duvalier, elected president in 1957, he rules Haiti until his death in 1971. His son, Jean-Claude Babydoc Duvalier, then rules the country until ousted in 1986. The number of Haitian refugees rises as thousands flee the homeland. Influxes of 18,000 Haitian and 125,000 Cuban refugees onto U.S. soil result in the Carter administration creating a new immigration classification called entrance. Neither refugees nor asylum seekers without any real legal status. The Reagan administration establishes an interdiction at sea program. Hundreds of boats intercepted. Tens of thousands of Haitians are returned to Port-au-Prince from 1981 to 1991. Jean-Bertrand Aristide is elected president in February 1991, ousted by a coup in September. President George H.W. Bush establishes a 12,000-person refugee camp at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and when the camp fills up, he orders the return of all Haitians picked up at sea. President Bill Clinton commits the U.S. to restoring a democratic government in Haiti. President Aristide returns to power in November and remains in office through end of term in 1996. Re-elected, Aristide returns to presidency in 2001, only to be ousted again in a 2004 coup, remaining in exile until 2011. President Barack Obama's administration adopts a metering policy limiting the number of migrants entering U.S. territory. A massive magnitude 7.0 earthquake strikes Haiti in January 2010. More than 300,000 people killed, more than one and a half million homeless. That 2010 earthquake was the worst in 200 years. Hurricane Matthew makes landfall in October 2016, 500 deaths and widespread destruction. In December 2018, President Donald Trump's administration announces the creation of a migrant protection policy that requires asylum seekers to await their proceedings in Mexico. Acting Prime Minister Ariel Henry assumes office following the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. A magnitude 7.2 earthquake strikes Haiti August 14, 2021. Two days later, Haiti suffers a direct hit from Tropical Depression Grace. Today, Haiti is a country marred by gang violence, with some estimates placing nearly 80% of the capital under the control of warring gangs. In just the first eight months of 2023, more than 2,400 people in Haiti were reported killed, nearly 1,000 kidnapped, and more than 900 injured, according to UN statistics. In October 2023, the UN Security Council approves the deployment to Haiti of a multinational armed force led by Kenya to restore order. The United States says it is pledging as much as $300 million to the effort. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. Gary Pierre Pierre is a journalist who previously worked for the New York Times and later founded the Haitian Times. It's a publication focused on Haiti and the Haitian diaspora. Christina Casado Smith sat down with the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for his take on the situation both in and out of Haiti. Gary Pierre Pierre, can you please explain um, initially um, a historical reference on how Haiti got onto this impasse? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Christina. Uh, Haiti uh, got to where it is since the day after it became an independent nation, essentially. And this is a country at the dawn of its independence, was isolated, because you have to remember these were uh, not too long at that, at that time, not, not too long, they were um, slaves. It was a slave uh, French colony. And so they were able to defeat uh, Napoleon's army and after the end of the war and Haiti gets independence, then it was isolated. Now, in recent weeks or months, um, why do you think the situation has worsened? Well, uh, it's just a 
continuation of into the abyss and to the bottom because the police have been really weak and so it has emboldened the gangs so therefore if the if there's a leadership vacuum and the, the opposition if you will in this case criminal gangs uh they just uh go from one extreme to another uh and the the political uh void has really created that to me as much as anything else because uh when you're unable to come to any sort of political consensus uh then you have these gangs who are heavily armed and uh, running rampant with very little uh pushback from the police then you know you get to where we are now i would imagine that and the uh this is not the end of it now who are the players involved in the current conflict and why okay uh the players involved are first of all obviously Ariel Henry who is the uh prime minister and his cabinet then you have the gang leaders uh chiefly most Americans uh will know of uh, Jimmy Cherize known colorfully as barbecue and then you have a whole host of other gang uh leaders who are equally powerful then you have some of the political opposition principally the Montana Accord people which is the opposition you have the international community of course the UN the US and you have another element that just recently uh developed is the uh, arrival of Guy Philippe who was a former uh soldier officer and police officer uh who just recently came back was deported from the United States after spending years in jail for money laundering and other illicit activities and so this guy he also was part of a he led a coup a rebellion against Jean Bertrand Aristide in 2004 and so now he's back he's a major player and a destabilizing force uh in the, on, in the country right now Mr Pierre we have noticed in the last couple of days um how the international community how the international media also it's interested on on finding a solution but what is the role that in that the international community it's doing right now in Haiti and do you think it may have success well right now the US and and the UN are trying to get a Kenyan led force into Haiti to help stabilize the security situation that's the extent of it and what they should be doing uh is that and then some i think there should be a comprehensive plan of action how do we move haiti forward with some key sectors the people in haiti themselves the haitian diaspora i mean in the case in america i would say haitian american and then uh the inter international community itself the us should have a strong partnership bring the, those of us in the diaspora and and with a uh, counterpart you know in haiti then come up with a plan that address the social economic issues and the security issues and you know development issues Haiti needs a reset button it's a chance this is a moment i'm hoping to be where we can really seize a window of opportunity and move forward like most matters of international cooperation nuance exists between what leaders say they'll do and what their citizens want them to do While some Kenyans support President William Ruto's insistence on sending a police mission to Haiti, many others wonder why they should lead a multinational force when other more powerful and better equipped nations have not stepped forward. For more, let's go to VOA Nairobi Bureau Chief Mariama Diallo. Passions are running high in the streets of Nairobi over possibly deploying the country's police to Haiti. Now why are you sending police instead of sending military to for such a such a such thing that's my question it does nothing because we're going to lose our beloved ones kenya we don't have that power like the other countries like the united states i think that's a noble idea because uh, we are human beings although people are complaining about uh, the procedure which has been used we should urge the government of the day to at least follow the court orders let me conclude my remarks 
President William Ruto, who recently signed a long-awaited bilateral accord with visiting Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry to pave the way for 1,000 Kenyan police officers to lead a proposed multinational UN-backed force that would help restore security in Haiti, insists it's the right thing to do. It is a mission for humanity. It is a mission in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Haiti. However, signing that accord was immediately followed by a fierce battle between Haitian police and armed gangs who blocked Henry's return to the Caribbean nation and eventually pushed the prime minister to say he will resign as soon as a transitional council is put in place. Attorney Ikuru Okot was among a group that filed a petition before Kenya's high court that argued sending the country's police to Haiti was unconstitutional. He says the recent signing was misleading. First of all, it's a bogus agreement uh, because it has no legitimacy, uh, both in law and even on the person representing. Uh, Ariel Henry, for you to be able to enter into a contract, you must have capacity. To, to enter into a contract. And there are still problems whether this mission will go on or not because all the legal benchmarks have still not been satisfied, he says. When Jovenel Moise was killed in July 2021, Ariel Henry was only supposed to be in power for 120 days. For him to, be, to take over the role of a, a prime minister under the constitution of Haiti, he must be ratified, vetted by parliament and approved by parliament. He was never. So really the question then coming to the agreement, who is this who actually signed this agreement with the Republic of Kenya? George Musamali, a security consultant based in Nairobi, says it's time to rethink the Haitian issue. What people have not focused on is the reason for this turmoil for all these years. Remember, we started talking about trouble in Haiti in 1805 when they first declared independence from the French. To date, Haiti has not seen peace. So basically, the solutions that we've been putting on the table, are they working? There have been several unsuccessful interventions, including efforts by the United States and the United Nations. It's time to try something new, he says. Basically, what they were going to do is to deal with the same, same, same people we call gangs that they have America, the American intervention tried in, 20, in 1815, did not succeed. It tried again in uh, 1994, did not work. We tried again under the UN in uh, 2004 and it still did not work. With such a hostile and volatile situation now in Haiti, Musamawi says it's hard to envision that a military or a police intervention would work. Mariama Diallo, VOA News, Nairobi. VOA's Creole Service has several of its own reporters reporting from Haiti. They are experiencing the same dangers as the citizens who call the Caribbean nation home. For more on the challenges our reporters and their team back in D.C. face, Robin Guess from our Press Freedom Desk spoke with the chief of VOA's Creole Service, Sandra Lemaire. Given the crisis and current chaos in Haiti, how dangerous is it for journalists with boots on the ground? It's extremely dangerous right now. Um, it's actually a concern that I have every single day. We have documented in 2023 that journalists in Haiti have been killed. They have been kidnapped and they have been the victims of just extraordinary violence. At this point, to what degree would you say it is an act of courage for rep reporters to keep doing what they're doing? Absolutely it is. They um, are very passionate about reporting, um, and so that's what gets them out onto the streets. You know, not only obviously the gangs are a huge threat, but law enforcement also has really no respect for reporters. Just um, recently, last week or the week before, one reporter just about lost his eye. He lost his vision in an eye because they were shooting uh, tear gas. One of those tear gas canisters hit him in the eye 
and he ended up, you know, in the hospital. And to them, it's just collateral damage. They don't care that you're, you know, there to report. So Haiti is a country that uh, on paper has freedom of the press, but the press has been abused for many, many years in Haiti. My biggest fear is that they'll be killed while reporting, which um, I would be beyond heartbroken about. Um, because, you know, I care a lot about all of them. I've known them for many years before I became the chief of the service. We just, in January of this year, towards the end of January, had um, training for them on hostile environment training. So my eight reporters who are in the biggest danger, they all attended this uh, training. And, um, you know, they, have by the grace of God, have been saved, except for the one reporter I mentioned. He was reporting on the situation in a prison where inmates had died because they weren't being fed and poor, poor conditions in this jail in the north of Haiti. And he was threatened by a police, national police officer, at gunpoint, threatening him to say, don't publish this because it makes us look bad. And it's a lie. And he said, you know, it's not a lie. I talked to an official. The official confirms this. So we're going to go with it. And he pointed the gun at his head and said, you know, I can kill you right now if I wanted to. So of course, we complained to the police. The person was reassigned, so they actually did act. But it's not like I have a lot of faith. My second biggest fear is that they are kidnapped. Um, and abused and tortured um, because that also, you know, would be heartbreaking for me and nerve wracking. And, you know, to me, there's no story that's worth losing your life over. I value life over, you know, reporting. I mean, of course, the story is important, but not more important than their lives. So that's really my biggest concern. He was one of the music world's biggest stars in the 1990s as founding member of the Fugees. Since then, Wyclef Jean has become a seven-time platinum-selling artist with three Grammy Awards to his credit. Nine albums and 78 million records sold. He is an internationally recognized name. He has also not been shy about his presidential aspirations. VOA recently spoke with Jean. I'm, I'm talking from experience. Mm -hmm. I was in Haiti when the entire UN force was there. Okay. What has it done since then? I was there in Bel Air. But that's then. People will tell you that's then. Now we're talking about a Kenyan force that has a specific mission now. But what, going into Haiti and fighting the gangs why and don't stabilizing you take, the, the country. Again, you see all this energy that's being used now in Ariel Henry? Mm -hmm. Why don't you take that money and put it in the Haitian institutions. Which institution? Wh which wh I would put the to? money in the police force. The police force is corrupted, put, according to put, the U.S. government and the reports from again, the U.N. Again, mm -hmm. not all the police force is corrupted. Do you, it's like you talking to me right now, and we talking about the U.S., and I say, oh, the police force is corrupted, right? Mm -hmm. We know I there's understand. parts. Of, I know that there's parts, right? Weave through it. The national, the, the army. Like, restore that, right? You have a real organization in BESAP. All I'm saying is, in conjunction, why are the, the, the Haitian institutes never included as part of that? And the number one thing is corruption. Then why don't you vest in fighting an anti-corruption unit, right? Mm -hmm. I Correct. do believe, and remember, I do say this, I do believe that our Kenyan African brothers and sisters going into Haiti, a thousand people, Mm -hmm. And going against the gangs, remember I told you, I just see a forecast again of just disaster. disaster. I don't agree so with that policy. No, I don't. You don't agree. No. So you don't agree with the, the Kenyan going to Haiti? And then people say to me, all right, take Ariel Henry out and then what? Right? That's the question now. That, right? yeah, I was like, going to come to that. It's a big question, right? It is a question. So Take him out and then what? Mm -hmm. But I say, leave him in. And what do you see that's happening? Thank you for being with us on The Inside Story. Stay up to date with all the latest news at voanews.com. Catch up on past episodes at our free streaming service, VOA+. Plus. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you today's show, I'm Elizabeth Lee. We'll see you next week for The Inside Story. Mm -hmm.